Sao Paulo is a state in Brazil. It is the major industrial and economic powerhouse of the Brazilian economy. Named after St. Paul, Sao Paulo has the largest population, industrial complex, and economic production in the country. It is the richest state in Brazil. The capital, Sao Paulo, is also the largest city in South America. Often dubbed the locomotive of Brazil, the state alone is responsible for 40% of the Brazilian GDP, being the state with the highest GDP. In addition to increased GDP, Sao Paulo also has the highest human development index, the highest GDP per capita, the second lowest infant mortality rate and the fourth lowest rate of illiteracy among among the states of Brazil, with 44,035,304 inhabitants in 2014. Sao Paulo is the most populous state in Brazil and the third most populous political unit of South America, only surpassed by that country and Colombia, ahead of all other South American countries. Sao Paulo's capital city is ranked 13th among the largest cities on the planet and its metropolitan area, with 20,935,204 inhabitants, is the 7th largest in the world. Regions near the city of Sao Paulo are also metropolitan areas, such as Campinas, Santos. Soricaba and São José dos Campos. Other nearby cities include urban areas in the conurbation process, such as Santo André, São Bernardo do Campo, São Catano, Diadema, Piracicaba, Garol Hos, Uzascu, Tabor da Serra and Jundurai. The total population of these areas coupled with the capital, the so-called expanded metropolitan complex, exceeds 29 million inhabitants, i.e., approximately 75% of the population of Sao Paulo statewide. The metropolitan regions of Campinas and Sao Paulo now form the first macro-metropolis in the Southern Hemisphere, joining 65 municipalities that together are home to 12% of the Brazilian population. History Early period in pre-European times, the area that is now Sao Paulo State was occupied by the two peoples nation, who subsisted through hunting and cultivation. The first European to settle in the area was João Ramalho, a Portuguese sailor who may have been shipwrecked around 1510, ten years after the first Portuguese landfall in Brazil. He married the daughter of a local chieftain and became a settler. In 1532, the first colonial expedition, led by Martim Afonso de Souza of Portugal, landed at São Vicente. De Souza added Ramalho's settlement to his colony. Early European colonization of Brazil was very limited. Portugal was more interested in Africa and Asia. But with English and French privateer ships just off the coast, the territory had to be protected. Unwilling to shoulder the burden of defense himself, the Portuguese ruler, King João III of Portugal, divided the coast in two captaincies, or swathes of land 50 leagues apart. He distributed them among well-connected Portuguese, hoping that each would be self-reliant. The early port and sugar cultivating settlement of São Vicente was one rare success connected to this policy. In 1548, João III brought Brazil under direct royal control. Fearing Indian attack, he discouraged development of the territory's vast interior. Some whites headed nonetheless for Piratininga, a plateau near São Vicente, drawn by its navigable rivers and agricultural potential. Border do Campo, the Plateau Settlement, became an official town in 1553. The history of Sao Paulo City proper begins with the founding of a Jesuit mission on January 25, 1554, the anniversary of St. Paul's conversion. The station, which is at the heart of the current city, was named São Paulo dos Campos de Piratininga. In 1560, the threat of Indian attack led many to flee from the exposed Santo André da Borda do Campo to the walled Colegio. Two years later, the Colegio was besieged. Though the town survived, fighting took place sporadically for another three decades. 
By 1600, the town had about 1,500 citizens and 150 households. Little was produced for export, save a number of agricultural goods. The isolation was to continue for many years, as the development of Brazil centered on the sugar plantations in the northeast. The city's location, at the mouth of the Taya to Paranapanema River system, made it an ideal base for another activity, enslaving expeditions. The economics were simple. Enslaved manpower for Brazil's northern sugar plantations were in short supply. Enslaved Africans were expensive, so demand for indigenous captives soared. The task was, nonetheless, hard, if not impossible, to achieve. Expansion among those who attempted to enslave the native were explorers of the hinterland called Bandeirantes. From their base in Sao Paulo, they also combed the interior in search of natural riches. Silver, gold and diamonds were companion pursuits, as well as the exploration of unknown territories. Roman Catholic missionaries sometimes tagged along, as efforts for converting the native worked hand-in-hand -hand with Portuguese colonialism. Despite their atrocities, the Bandeirantes are now equally remembered for penetrating Brazil's vast interior. Trading posts established by them became permanent settlements. Interior routes opened up. Though the Bandeirantes had no loyalty to the Portuguese crown, they did claim land for the king. Thus, the borders of Brazil were pushed forward to the Amazon region and the Andes. Napoleon's invasion of Portugal in 1807 prompted the British Navy to evacuate King João VI of Portugal, Portugal's prince regent, to Rio de Janeiro and Brazil became the temporary headquarters of the Portuguese Empire. João Alvai rewarded his host with economic reforms that would prove crucial to São Paulo's rise. Brazil's ports, long closed to non-Portuguese ships, were opened up. Restrictions on manufacturing were waived. Portugal and Brazil, in other words, were ostensibly co-equals. Returning to Portugal six years later, João left his son, Pedro, to rule as regent and governor. Empire of Brazil period Pedro inherited his father's love of Brazil, resisting demands from Lisbon that Brazil should be ruled from Europe once again. Legend has it that in 1822 the regent was riding outside Sao Paulo when a messenger delivered a missive demanding his return to Europe, and Dom Pedro waved his sword and shouted, Independence era morte. João had whetted the appetite of Brazilians, who now sought a full break from the monarchy. The ever-restless Paulistas were at the vanguard of the independence movement. The small mother country of Portugal was in no position to resist. On September 7, 1822, Dom Pedro Rubai stamped Brazil's independence. He was crowned emperor shortly afterwards. The emperors ruled an independent Brazil until 1889. Over this time, the growth of liberalism in Europe had a parallel in Brazil. As the Brazilian provinces became more assertive, Sao Paulo was the scene of a minor liberal revolution 1842. When independence was declared, the city of Sao Paulo had just 25,000 people and 4,000 houses, but the next 60 years would see gradual growth. In 1828, the law school, the pioneer of the city's intellectual tradition, opened. The first newspaper, O Farol Palistino, appeared in 1827. Municipal developments such as botanical gardens, an opera house and a library gave the city a cultural boost. Regardless, Sao Paulo still faced many hurdles, especially transport. Mule trains were the main method of transportation, and the road from the plateau down to the port of Santos was famously arduous. In the late 1860s Sao Paulo got its first railway line, developed by British engineers, to the port of Santos. Other lines, such as a railway to Campinas, were soon built. This was good timing, because in the 1880s the coffee craze hit in earnest. Brazil, which had been growing it since the mid-18th century, could grow more. The Paraiba Valley, which spans the states of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, had suitable soil and climate. 
Sao Paulo City, at the western end of the Paraiba Valley, was well positioned to channel the coffee to the port of Santos. Republican era meanwhile, the Brazilian monarchy had fallen in 1889. A feudalistic regime, the New Republic had friends only among the sugar planters of the Northeast, whose dominance Paul Estanos, among others, despised. In 1891, a new federal constitution, which delegated power to the states, was approved. The new coffee elite saw its chance. Sao Paulo ironed out a power-sharing understanding, known as the Café Comlite deal, with dairy-rich Minas Gerais, Brazil's other dominant state. Together, they held a virtual lock on federal power. Brazilian politics now became a favorite pastime of the once rebellious Paula Stanos, who sent several presidents to Rio de Janeiro, including Prudente de Moraes, Brazil's first civilian president, who took office in 1894. Plantation labor was needed, this time for coffee, not sugar. Slavery had been fading since the import of enslaved Africans was outlawed in 1850. Sao Paulo, thanks to such figures as Luis Gama, was a center of abolitionism. In 1888, Brazil abolished slavery and the freed African Brazilians who had been helping build the nation were then forced to beg for their jobs back, working for food and shelter only because of the failure of the system to integrate them as equal citizens with Euro-Brazilians. In an effort to bleach the race, as the nation's leaders feared Brazil was becoming a black country, Spanish, Portuguese and Italian nationals were given incentives to become farm workers in Sao Paulo. The state government was so eager to bring in European immigrants that it paid for their trips and provided varying levels of subsidy. By 1893, foreigners made up over 55% of Sao Paulo's population. Fearing oversupply, the government applied the brakes briefly in 1899, then the boom resumed. From 1908, the Japanese arrived in great numbers, many destined for the plantations on fixed-term contracts. By 1920, Sao Paulo was Brazil's second largest city, a half century before, it had been just the tenth largest. Immigration and migration of Paulistas from other towns as well as Nordistinos and citizens from other states, the coffee industry, and modernization through the manufacturing of textiles, car and airplane parts, as well as food and technological industries, construction, fashion, and services transformed the greater Sao Paulo area into a thriving megalopolis and one of the world's greatest multi-ethnic regions. Early 20th century between 1901 and 1910, coffee made up 51% of Brazil's total exports, far overshadowing rubber, sugar and cotton. But reliance on coffee made Brazil vulnerable to poor harvests and the whims of world markets. The development of plantations in the 1890s, and widespread reliance on credit, took place against fluctuating prices and supply levels culminating in saturation of the international market around the start of the 20th century. The government's policies of valorization, borrowing money to buy coffee and stockpiling it, in order to have a surplus during bad harvests, and meanwhile taxing coffee exports to pay off loans, seemed feasible in the short term. But in the longer term, these actions contributed to oversupply and eventual collapse. Sao Paulo's industrial development, from 1889 into the 1940s, was gradual and inward-looking. Initially industry was closely associated with agriculture. Cotton plantations led to the growth of textile manufacturing. Coffee planters were among the early industrial investors. The boom in immigration provided a market for goods, and sectors such as food processing grew. Traditional immigrant families such as the Matarazzo, Dinais, Mofarage and Maluf became industrialists, entrepreneurs, and leading politicians. Restrictions on imports forced by world wars and government policies of import substitution and trade tariffs all contributed to industrial growth. 
By 1945, Sao Paulo had become the largest industrial center in South America. World War I sent ripples through Brazil. Inflation was rampant. Some 50,000 workers went on strike. Thus, the growing urban population grew increasingly resentful of the coffee elite. Disaffected intellectuals expressed their views during a memorable Week of Modern Art in 1922. Two years later, a garrison of soldiers staged a revolt. The standoff was also political. Politics had been long monopolized by the Paulista Revolutionary Party, but in 1926 a more left-leaning party rose in opposition. In 1928, the PRP amended Sao Paulo's state constitution to give it more control over the city. The turbulence was mirrored on Brazil's national scene. With the Great Depression, coffee prices plunged, as did real GDP. Americans, keen investors during the 1920s, backed away. The opening of the first highway between Sao Paulo and Rio in 1928 was one of the few bright spots. Into the breach stepped Getulio Vargas, a southerner veteran in state politics. In Brazil's 1930 presidential elections, he opposed Julio Prestes, a favorite son of Sao Paulo. Vargas lost the election, but with backing from Minas Gerais state, Sao Paulo's ever jealous former ally and neighbor to the north, he seized power regardless. Paulista War The Constitutionalist Revolution of 1932 or Paulista War is the name given to the uprising of the population of the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo against the federal government of Vargas. Its main goal was to press the provisional government headed by Getulio Vargas to enact a new constitution since it had revoked the previous one, adopted in 1889. However, as the movement developed and resentment against President Vargas grew deeper, it came to advocate the overthrow of the federal government and the secession of Sao Paulo from the Brazilian Federation. But, it is noted that the separatist scenario was used as guerrilla tactics by the federal government to turn the population of the rest of the country against the state of Sao Paulo, broadcasting the alleged separatist notion throughout the country. There is no evidence that the movement's commanders sought separatism. The uprising started on July 9, 1932, after five protesting students were killed by government troops on May 23, 1932. On the wake of their deaths, a movement called MMDC started. A fifth victim, Alvarenga, was also shot that night, but died months later. Revolutionary troops entrenched in the battlefield. In a few months, the state of Sao Paulo rebelled against the federal government. Counting on the solidarity of three other powerful states, the politicians of Sao Paulo expected a quick war. However, that solidarity was never translated into actual support, and the Sao Paulo Civil War was won by the Federation on October 2, 1932. In spite of its military defeat, some of the movement's main demands were finally granted by Vargas afterwards. The appointment of a non-military state governor, the election of a constituent assembly and, finally, the enactment of a new constitution in 1934. However that constitution was short-lived, as in 1937, amidst growing extremism on the left and right wings of the political spectrum, Vargas closed the National Congress and enacted another constitution, which established an authoritarian regime called Estado Novo. Late 20th century Vargas's rule was a study in political turbulence. Elected in 1934, he ruled by dictatorship from 1937 to 1945, a period dubbed the Estado Novo. Thrown out by a coup in 1945, he ran for office again in 1950, and was overwhelmingly elected. On the verge of being overthrown from office again, he committed suicide in 1954. Vargas's main legacy was the centralization of power, the encouragement of industry and diversification of agriculture, not to mention the abolition of subsidies on coffee finally did away with the dominance of the coffee oligarchies. His replacement, Jew Shelanorki Bitchek, focused on heavy industry. 
Kubitschek built car factories, steel plants, hydropower infrastructure and roads. Petrobras, Brazil's oil monolith, was set up in 1953. By 1958, Sao Paulo State controlled some 55% of Brazil's industrial production, up from 17% in 1907. Another of Kubitschek's pet projects was the creation of Brasilia, which became Brazil's capital in 1960, the year Kubitschek stepped down. The University of Sao Paulo was founded in 1934, two years after Sao Paulo's failed uprising. It has established itself as the most prestigious higher learning institution in the country, with a transitional government from military to civil and a new currency that made stagnant the economy during the mid to late 1980s. Unemployment and crime became rampant. Sao Paulo, by now the world's third largest city after Mexico City and Tokyo, was hard hit. Wealthy Brazilians retreated to suburb and highly secured housing complexes such as Alphaville and Favelas. Pockets of substandard living slums that lined the periphery had a tremendous growth. For the first time in history, Brazil experienced large segments of its population immigrating to continents such as North America, Europe, Australia, and East Asia, particularly to Japan. Geography The state of Sao Paulo has an area of approximately 248,200 square kilometers, and a population of about 44 million, which makes it the most populous country subdivision in the Americas. The climate of Sao Paulo is tropical to subtropical, altitude being the largest contributor to what variation there is. The capital, Sao Paulo City, barely outside the tropics in the south of the state and about 780 meters above sea level, has daily minima and maxima averaging about 18 degrees Celsius and 28 degrees Celsius respectively at the warmest time of year and about 11 degrees Celsius and 21 degrees Celsius respectively at the coolest time of year. Temperatures reach around 33 degrees Celsius on the hottest days and fall as low as 6 degrees Celsius on the coldest nights. In the low-lying northwest of the state, temperatures average around 4 degrees Celsius higher. Sao Paulo is the richest state in Brazil. It has the second highest per capita income in, with the states of Rio Grande do Sul and Santa Catarina, the highest standard of living in Brazil. Despite the poverty in some peripheral parts of the largest cities, major cities 1, Sao Paulo, 2, Garalhos, 3, Campinas, 4. São Bernardo do Campo 5. Santo André 6. Uzasco 7. São José dos Campos 8. Ribeiro Preto 9. Soricaba 10. Santos 11. Maua 12. São José do Rio Preto 13. Mogi das Cruzes 14. Diadema